Hello and welcome to Call of Discovery, the podcast where we celebrate Keyforge, its community, and the excitement of discovery. Uh, I am Zach Armstrong, as usual, and uh, as usual, I'm so excited to be joined by Ed. Ed, how are you today? I am very, very well, Zach. And in fact, I am incredibly excited because we might just have some of the architects of the Crucible on the podcast with us. <laughs> well, if you've read the lore, they're awfully elusive. So um, it feels it does feel a little strange to be lore breaking so hard. Uh, but today we have we have two lovely people here uh, on the microphones with us. You've you've seen them and heard them in several other places uh, so far since uh, a fateful time in June, at least for the uh, the the public. Uh, so we have we have uh, Michael Hurley. Michael, could you just uh, introduce yourself and what what is your title? And I know you've got multiple titles at multiple uh, places here. Sure. Yeah. So thank you, Zach uh, and Ed. Um, I'm Michael Hurley. I'm the director of operations at Ghost Galaxy. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and we also have uh, Christian T. Peterson. How are you today, Christian? I am great. I'm great. Thanks for having us on your show. I'm uh, I'm the the CEO of of Ghost Galaxy, and uh, indeed one of the architects. So so be That's nice. That's right. That's right. Uh, you also have the luxury. One, I think, Michael at least on the websites has not taken taken up on you because you titled yourself the strangest star at the parent company that, strange that's star. right <laughs> that's right <laughs> excellent um, undoubtedly I, <laughs> yeah that's uh that's fantastic um My michael is your is your nickname nickname title position is that just still in the works or are you are you just staying away from uh the the off the beaten path titles there uh, I'm just sticking with, uh, with director of operations for now. Thanks. So that's, um, that's pretty yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, when I first joined back up with Christian, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I did bounce around to a, a few different projects at different companies, but I am full-time ghost galaxy now. So, uh, I just think about Keyforge all day, every day. <laughs> that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah excellent so maybe uh well i guess i guess you might be the ghostliest galaxy but well i think director of operations probably <laughs> raises uh fewer eyebrows um and uh just in doing a bit of research on on both of you for this uh you two have been paired together since the ffg days and kind of taken the journey together over the last 15 years or so is that is that about right that's right yeah i first came to ffg in 2007 and have worked with Christian almost continuously since then. Excellent. Now, Sounds right. Yeah. Christian, is that through uh, threats of violence or is there a healthy working relationship there? Well, I, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's at least a modicum of insanity on Michael's part. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, oh. uh, other than that, uh, I guess good luck on mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it, it certainly seems to be, it certainly seems to be that way. And, um, from uh, so, from what I understand about Keyforge and Ghost Galaxy in the process so far, a modicum of insanity um, has been a bit required through the entire process. Uh, there oh, was yes. there was a metaphor, Christian, you used uh, in the initial interviews before uh, after the announcement of the acquisition, as we were coming up on the GameFound campaign. There was a metaphor you used repeatedly to describe the acquisition of Keyforge. You said it was like trying to catch a falling knife. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have a question I've wanted to ask you ever since I've heard that. Are, are you familiar with the traditional wisdom in kitchens, uh, professional or otherwise, with falling knives? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm lo I look forward to, to being enlightened about it. What, what, what's, what is it? <laughs> I was wondering if you were making a joke about the risk of purchasing Keyforge because I worked in a lot of professional kitchens. The rule is you absolutely do not try to catch a falling knife. Oh, sure. Yes. You do that, not that, do it. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, okay, good, good. Yes, I, 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 I generally adhere to that same rule. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, safety, uh, you know, safety and all, but, but uh, you know, sometimes something zooms by that just is, you know, precious enough, even though it may be sharp, that maybe you just try to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's that I, I think I said about that, maybe not about that related to Keyforge in particular, but I've, I've mentioned it as a general rule of thumb in trying to revive kind of a, you know, a dead game or a dying game uh, or, you know, or, or a game that has 
troubled for, for, for whatever reason, um, despite mm. how much one may love it, it's very difficult to do and, and um, generally not advisable. Um, even in the professional kitchen of games publishing, <laughs> um, and this this will the, this one though we we decided to you know throw caution to the wind and decide that, that it was worth it because it was simply such a uh, big deal for us to make it originally. Uh, it's 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 such a great game and it and that we we felt that the sell in of the game had been so large that that even with a much diminished community, it would still be large enough to support a, you know, a good business uh, and to be able to be, uh, you know, a good feather in the cap for Ghost Galaxy. Uh, and so you, using that analogy, Christian, and t- continuing the trend, wh- where is Keyforge in, in that slow-mo, the knife is falling, the game found campaign is the hand coming to catch it, successful game ca- game found campaign uh, have you have you successfully grabbed the knife excellent question i mean the metaphor does tend to get a little old <laughs> once <laughs> once it, uh, it it loses its effect a little bit um i mean i i would say the knife probably hasn't stopped falling until we successfully um get not even winds of exchange out but probably grim reminders out because mm. um mm-hmm. there there is a degree of honeymooning that you that you get into once you get the good news out that you're trying to revive somebody's game, you know, and, and then you start getting into the real life and nuts and bolts of things. And, and uh, that's when it gets much harder and you can't please everyone and you have to make decisions that, that, that may not be the, what some, some, some had dreamt of. And of course there's a practical nature of, you know, gathering the, the people, the infrastructure um, to successfully get this into the market. Um, but that's more, you know, once once we we wrap our head around getting this this winds of exchange out, and we've really uh, been very very excited that the, the software to make you forge is, is back and stronger than ever. A lot of the uh, a lot of the sharp edges of the knife certainly seems to have um, been avoided. Uh, they, but but I, I still think we're not out of the out of the woods until we've gotten winds of exchange out. Um, but also been able to get into more of a routine support organized play and of course supplying a the grim exchange uh, so the grim reminders um expansion in a way that's 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 more typical and much less dramatic obviously than the um than what, what happened with with uh, the game over the summer and going into the kickstarter and and the, the success of the i should say that the crowdfunding campaign uh, and the success of that and, and of course all the work we are we're doing um related to the actual manufacturing and release of it. Yeah, for sure. I think I think that is something I've I've seen a few people talking about looking forward to uh, yeah, what is that what does that regular cadence look like? What does it look like when uh Keyforge is having uh that regular release? Uh there's a, there's a there's a, a pattern to it. There's a a drum beat to it. Um, and how that can be just uh, a win-win for everybody, which of course we we very much we very much hope it is, and that the con- trajectory continues to to trend up there. Yep, with uh, uh, we got to get yeah. into a routine and and uh, try to try to sort of you know catch our sea legs uh, on it. Um, and that that's not an easy game to catch your sea legs on, just because of all the moving parts involved with it. But uh, I think we're we're uh, getting into a, into a really strong spot. Yeah, so we're very excited for all of that. Uh, and of course, uh, speaking of sea legs and a thousand things going on at once, uh, just a handful of weeks ago, uh, many of us were at Keyforge Celebration. Many were not, but it was this wonderful testing ground, also just a celebration for the community uh, mm-hmm. where a lot of things were tested. The people got to play Winds of Exchange, myself included. Uh, it was so much fun. And so uh, we want to ask, as you all gathered all this feedback uh, from data from the event, from qualitative feedback from the event, uh, what was what were some of the most interesting things the teams learned uh, at Keyforge Celebration? Uh, well, I think uh, first and foremost, we got some great confirmation that the Keyforge community uh, is a is a great, lively, vibrant uh, bunch. That was it was super awesome to see uh, such a great turnout at the event. Given that we had uh, relatively little time to announce it, and um, for everybody to get their travel plans uh, together, we we had I think about two hundred people attending because um, we did get a few walk ins, uh, local walk ins at the event. So I think uh, final numbers were right around two hundred participants. Uh, we ran four different tournaments, um, major tournaments over that weekend, plus a bunch of side events. So it was a great, 
uh, testing ground to try out lots of different things. And um, I would say we, we had a, overall the, the event was a great success. I think a lot of people had a lot of fun, myself included. And we did learn a lot. Um, we got to try out Winds of Exchange kind of like in the wild, so to speak. And um, and we had on chain decks uh, too that uh, was uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a, it was a good experiment. I'm really really happy that everybody liked when uh, the Unchained decks as much as they did. And it was also a nice little way to kind of test a much deeper card pool um, and make sure that um, that things were working. Uh, as intended. And of course, we mm. discovered, you know, that there were a handful of things that weren't working the way that they were supposed <laughs> to. Um, and so we, everybody was very gracious with their with their feedback. And I got lots and lots of pictures from people about problematic cards or, um, uh, you know, just um, uh, manufacturing defects, you know, that sort of thing. So that that was uh, all that was super helpful. And, um, and as all it is making Keyforge a better product. Yeah, I would say that the Unchained that uh, we did at Celebration is almost like a, you could you could say there was an Unchained beta in a way because it's mm. uh, you know we with, with that with that kind of product, wild and crazy, you know, wild hair kind of all 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 in. It, it's still it's still not as easy as it as it sounds. Uh, there, there are still some some things that has to be done on a technical basis, and um, you know even though everybody wants cards that are all in. They still don't want, you know, the obvious issues such as not what card referring to an artifact that uh, there's no artifacts in the deck, you know, you know all, all those things. So, so what, what, it, what it really is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a still a curated and thoughtful wild hair experience um, that needs to be done. So very carefully crafted wild hair, like me in middle school. There's lots of gel. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> we need pictures, I guess, to judge that. <laughs> Oh, I, I for one, am so excited about uh, Keyforge Unchained. It is tr- almost trying to out Keyforge Keyforge, which is the most Keyforge thing that Keyforge can possibly be. And um, so, very, very excited to get my hands on some of those decks. But you know, I, I'm interested following that almost beta run of of the wildest Keyforge mode imaginable. How do you feel about it? Did it did it sort of perform as you'd hoped? And what role can you see for un- Unchained moving forwards? I would say that it, by and large, it was very successful. And if anything, I thought that it wasn't quite Unchained enough. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. And so it, it's, I mean, there's definitely plenty of examples of like really wild, awesome Unchained decks. But I also saw a, a few too many Unchained decks that just weren't quite Unchained enough. Mm. So I, I I made some notes and went back in and tweaked the rule set, you know, just a little bit to, to correct a few things that uh, weren't quite working the way I had expected them to. And um, so I think the the next time we uh, uh, we do these, it's, it's going to just, you know, be even better than it was before. So, uh, and like I said before too, it's like we also did identify some some important problems with a few legacy cards. Hmm. Uh, you know, like there was a card that showed up with pre errata text and there was another card that had the wrong artwork. And so there's you know, a, a few things like that that we were able to, to correct on the back end, so. Yeah. On the other hand, I think uh, there was Virtually no problems found with Winds of Exchange itself, which which is what we had spent you know the vast line shared of our you know of, of our time on, and uh, I think Mike had only been able to touch Unchained uh, only for for a week or two prior to to us doing that first test run. So so I think mm-hmm. it was it was quite successful in terms of where Unchained lies in the kind of the pantheon of Keyforge. I uh, to me it is a it is kind of the weird uncle um, <laughs> that comes to visit on holidays, and it's super fun. Uh, but it's it's something that we will put out there uh, at special events. Uh, we may do, you know, a few of them, uh, release them to the retailers uh, that are particularly 
uh, huge supporters of the game. So, so they'd be able to put on a few unchained events. So, so it's, it's something that, that I think is, is a really fun thing that we can use with, with, uh, as a spice, uh, and, but with constraint, uh, right. because it's, it's, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it should be kind of a fun dessert, um, and not, not the main dish. Um, I, I would say what probably I thought was the most amazing thing, and this maybe goes back to this, the nature of the community about on chain that I've felt with at or felt at the celebration was that we had this, we came up with this concept of uh, unchained duels where you would have your, your, your badge um, for the event. You have one side that has had, you know, the regular graphics, you know, I'm an attendee of the event. You could flip that around and, and to the unchained duel side that sort of said, Hey, I, uh, I will duel anybody. Um, and the, we had set up the, 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 the the possibility of people if they duel different people and, and they lost i think it was two or three times then they could actually get another unchained deck because chances are that they maybe got a really bad one or whatever and so <laughs> um what really really surprised me in a very positive way was was that how many people really lean, you know lend into that you know they we i think we registered some 800 plus games uh, that actually wow. were registered with us people come up and say i play you know this wow. person and you know i won or i lost uh, and that, which was, which is really great. So it meant not only were people having fun playing the Unchained, but, but there's this, this concept like going out and gunslinging and people saying, Hey, I see your badges on duels. Want to play? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, which, which is a, is awesome because it, you know, it, it, hopefully what it's done is, is format, you know, new relationships, people met, get to meet new people. Uh, and, um, that, that I think is a very, very key, important part of, uh, of any game community is the ability to form new connections. Um, and it seemed like that really worked really well. And Unchained being such a wild and crazy format, it, I, I don't think people felt too competitive, a little competitive, yes, but but uh, but kind of the whole nature of the wild hair, you know, format is it really allowed a, a kind of a, you know, a great, great community building, you know, activity. And I think that to me was probably one of the most important things that came out of it. Just, just a surprise how well that worked and how, people, how much people were into it. So much of the fact that, I mean, the guy we were recording, those tournaments, he's like, oh, it's crazy. There's so many. <laughs> he was almost overwhelmed recording the actual <laughs> results. Uh, we, I mean, we, we thought there would be less than half half of that. Um, I, mean, I guess we were just maybe, uh, I was maybe thinking people would be more shy uh, than they ended up being. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, it was a fantastic social mix, mixer. Uh, I played with plenty of people I hadn't met before. Uh, which was fantastic. Uh, but like you said about the weird uncle, if the weird uncle is around on more than just holidays, he starts to just be the weird uncle and not the weird and funny uncle. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good, a good part of the vision. I think a good part of the vision. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And um, Michael, uh, you mentioned uh, as far as Keyforge celebration lessons, as we were uh, warming up on the mics here, you mentioned a couple specific lessons uh, about Alliance standard. Uh, would, would you mind going through a, a few of those lessons that you all took away? Sure. Yeah. So uh, of course, uh, Keyforge celebration was the first time we were able to try out Alliance as a format. Yeah. Uh, we ran two different Alliance events. We did a sealed event that was our largest of the four major tournaments of the weekend was Alliance Sealed, with it, which had 119 players. And then Alliance Standard um, was the day after. We had 57 uh, people playing in Alliance Standard. And then at, going on at the same time, we also had an Archon Standard tournament that had 85 players. Um, but Alliance Standard was um, particularly interesting to me because it was it was our chance to try out um, you know like the it was the format where where it basically it was as as open of a deck construction process as as we could give players hmm. uh, so you could for those who don't know you can take. Um, up to three different Archon decks from the same set and take any one house pod out of that deck and then combine them together to form a single Alliance deck. And your Alliance deck must consist of exactly three different pods, all from different the same houses, set. Yeah. Different uh, yeah, houses, yep. different houses, yep. Different, right, three right. different houses, uh, all from the same set. And then... On top of that, we added a small restricted list where 
um, there was a, a, a handful of cards where you could only choose one card off of that list that could appear in your deck. So you could have and one card in the specified quantity. There was most cards in the restricted list. You can have any number of copies of that one card by name, but there was a few cards where you were limited to only a single copy. Right. And we added the restricted list to the Alliance Center format in part to just kind of set the precedent that, you know, to tell the community, it's just like we, this format is going to require some additional restrictions in order to keep the play experience positive and healthy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to try to start off with what I consider to be like the least restrictive list possible. And um, just, and just to kind of see what happened. And I was pleasantly surprised that we, at the diversity of the decks that we saw. So like I said, we had 57 players in Alliance Standard, um, but they include pods from every single set, including Winds of Exchange. Wow. Oh my. <laughs> and, and, um, and yes, Mass Mutation was the most popular set, but not by much. Mm. Um, there was plenty of Call of the Archons, Age of Ascension, and Worlds Collide pods, and there was also uh, a handful of Dark Tidings uh, pods yeah. in there too. And one and one made the top cut, even a Dark Tidings pod. That's I right. Believe. Yes. Yeah. So that was that was uh, very good to see. Um, and there was also uh, quite a bit of diversity in the in the restricted cards, including the most popular restricted card, which was none. Uh, Twenty. <laughs> 20, 28 <laughs> decks uh, did not even include a, a restricted card. Um, so that was also interesting. And then, yeah. but, the, but the other half, um, it was. I was, I was uh, trying to think of the card called none. I'm like. Uh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that took me a while Christian there. Racking his brain. <laughs> yeah. Right. I don't remember that card. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, it's a, the, uh, so the other half of the decks uh, in, in the tournament. Um, it was a, a, a nice mixture of what was chosen as the restricted card. So, mm. yeah, there was, you know, there was Martian Generosity decks for sure, but there was also Time Traveler decks and Library Access decks. Um, there was a couple of Dark Amber Vaults. Um, there was a Ghost Form, uh, mm. a couple of Restoraguntus. Um, almost everything on the list was represented uh, in, in at least one, if not multiple decks. So that yeah. was very interesting to me. And, um, yeah. And, I, uh, I, 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 yeah, ahead, we, 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 we are also, you know, uh, it took a lot of, a lot of great feedback, you know, from, from a number of very, very uh, serious and, and, uh, thoughtful players about how to, you, you know, make that restriction list work. Uh, mm. in, in a way that would that would uh, both do what we want to do and actually make it uh, a little more interesting and easy to, easier to handle. So we sure. haven't come up with any final decisions on that, but but I think it, it, it really helped us, um, uh, I think, get our whole tournament guidelines and, and structure to the next level. Uh, we also made some some observations about, you know, Gee Forge is a, is a strange game that can both go very quick and take take a long time. So, so we um, uh, to to play one single match. So, so that I think we also made some observations about you know the actual how to best run the actual tournaments uh, in in terms of number of brackets and mm. the uh, the second ember league and and uh, buys and, and and of course how many matches uh, you're actually going to play in in after the after the cut and all that stuff. Yeah. Fantastic. It, sound, it sounds like it was a, a big success. It sounds like it was a big success, both on uh, getting everybody there and, and, and learning a, a lot about these four. 9.9 9 out of 10, for sure. Fantastic. I've, I've lived vicariously through, through those that have attended, but <laughs> I, have heard, I have heard so much exciting things and stories and just the wonders of things people opened in the uh, Unchained decks that, um, that you, you mentioned. Um, we're going to pivot over to some development questions now, uh, if we may. And um, yeah, Zach's going to come at this very much from the competitive mindset that Zach has. 
I, I myself am unashamedly a, a very casual Keyforge player. Um, so you're, you're probably going to get different tones of questions from from the two of us. But they, they say competitive, but I did try to run Rocket Tesmol and Alliance Standard, so I, I'm I'm not <laughs> above I'm not above some silliness. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. Otherwise, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be on Call of Discovery. That's Act. true. Yeah, one of the things about KeyForge is it's very different to other games in this space, right? And yeah, you've done a tremendous amount with the game in a short space of time. And um, honestly, taking on the design or the development of not just one set, but ostensibly two sets in in the shape of Winds of Exchange and a KeyForge Unchained set is uh, is mind boggling. Um, but you, you've probably come across your fair share of misconceptions about Keyforge over the past few months. And so what, what do you think is the most misunderstood thing about Keyforge? And um, what, what are you both uh, planning to, to counter to combat those, that, that misconception? Um, that's, a, that's, well, that's a good question. Um, what is the most common misconception? misunderstanding or misconception about Keyforge. Um, I suppose the first thing that comes to mind is that I, th I think a lot of people expect Keyforge to be one thing. And, but a lot of people, once they start talking amongst themselves, they realize that the, that the one thing that they thought for sure Keyforge was, is not the same thing that the other people in the room were con absolutely convinced that it was. Uh, and so I, I think Keyforge can be uh, a very a highly competitive game enjoyed by, you know, by people who love that kind of like high competitive kind of like tournament level play experience. Um, but it can also be just as fun and enjoyable and accessible to people who just want a nice, uh, quick, fun game around the kitchen table with um without a huge uh money expenditure or time expenditure uh, it's still a relatively easy game to learn and it's a very easy game to get into because all you need is it, it, it's just one deck per player and you and uh and you can go and um i think it's very important that the game continues uh in that mindset and that we, we we recognize that the Keyforge fan base is very diverse and that people want different things out of the game and that we make sure that we continue creating new products that are exciting to all those people. Um, I don't want the game to skew too heavily in any one particular direction, whether it's very casual play uh, or highly competitive, very complex. Kind of a play. I think it, it has to it has to kind of be somewhere in the middle. Uh, and and you mentioned complexity there, and I think complexity has a very interesting interesting role to play in a game like Keyforge. And you know we've seen very different complexities in in some of the different sets, arguably um, that Keyforge has released. Call of the Archons being yeah quite simple in uh, yeah a lot of the cards are are play effects they do something when you play them there's less maybe mental um, work to be done on looking at your board looking at all of the options available to you on any given turn contrast that with Dark Tidings where there was yeah quite a few different thinky pieces and it was almost like a, every turn being a puzzle to solve which has um a, a, an amazing role to play um, but i imagine it, you know too far in that direction almost risking um sort of higher um hiring the barrier to entry for 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 new players or for for casual players so how do you both feel the role uh what do you both feel the role for complexity is in keyforge moving forward um go ahead chris i mean it's it's uh it's, it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder you know what what's complex to one may not be as complex to to, to the next I mean, I think every game that I've ever seen released that has a the first initial release, right, is is going to take less risks with complexity or or, or trying to do things that 
that are more complex in, in the sense that it still needs to understand whether it can be taught itself uh, to, to, to a brand new audience. Um, so I'm not surprised at all that things got more complex after the uh, the call of the archons. The the risk is that that continues, and I I personally think that that uh, the kind of level of complexity that that you see in in uh, dark tidings, and I think I mean certainly um, token creatures are not super simple either, uh, right? Just just uh, the uh, maybe less so in play, but just the whole concept of what they are and what they represent, and that there's a bit of a pointer kind of abstraction. Where you have so oh, this card is actually blank, but it really means whatever is my, you know, is my element here or sitting in the side. There, there are different levels of complexity. Some of them are some are puzzly game in game. Some are more complex rules, or or things that that are less um, visually uh, understood than others. Um, but I, I I sort of felt that that there's going to be certain sets that are going to be more complex than others, depending on how what people feel you know is more complex to them. But but I, I I've seen games start like this and one of the risks that they that they get over time and i would say unless unless keyforge have had this big you know break that it's had i think it, it would probably quite, kind of within that risk factor is that the development team that develops for a game like like keyforge um can very easily get into a uh, a state where they're developing for themselves and they're developing for a, uh, what is a small audience of, you know, ultra sophisticated, um, testers, uh, and, and who, for, for who's, who's of course, who's, who are going to be far less, um, have far less problems with complexity than, than a new player because it, it everything that comes so naturally to, to them. Right. And so what, What's going to be intellectually stimulating to somebody in a, in a very advanced kind of a development group is going to be not necessarily, or it's going to be too overwhelming or, or confusing to somebody who's in a different mental state related to the game. Uh, and so that's why you see many TCGs and card games and, and living games like like uh, like Keyforge get into a to a cycle where um, uh, it, it feels like text text blocks becomes really really big, right? And and there are all these different complexity starts starts adding up, um, and that tends to turn away new players and casual players. So that that's that's sort of a, a ebb and flow of, of games like this that happen. I, I don't think that Keyforge reached a point where where it was insurmountable. Certainly, some people thought that the complexity level of of uh, Dark Tidings was a little high. Um, I personally think it was it was it was it was a maybe on the higher end of you know the spectrum but but I still felt that it that it felt well within kind of the the variations of, of where the game could be um it would be much more complicated maybe maybe not but certainly you wouldn't want all of the experiences to be on that end of the spectrum so you have to kind of uh as a development team kind of step back and saying that we're developing for a, for a multitude of of audiences, which is, you know, which, which Michael and I were talking about this the other day, and even Wizards in their early days, they, they quickly found out that they have a, a bunch of archetype players that all get different things out of, out of the, in this case, it was magic. Um, you know, you have certain players, they, they, they called them early on, they called, they called them Timmy, Johnny, and Spike, and they had these, these archetypes, and then they, they try to say, well, what is in this set that appeals to Timmy? What is in this set that appeals to Spike, etc.? cetera? Um, and, and that's, that's a, an astute, it's an astute philosophy. I, I don't necessarily know if the those archetypes are the same for Keyforge. I don't think they are, but but um, I think it is important for development teams to sort of keep that in mind and not and not, and not get into a uh, kind of a complexity spiral where they're developing for 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 themselves and, and, and for a very narrow group of of of, uh, of playtesters. So that's why it can be, and it's, it is it is hard for playtesters who want something simple. By the way, to get into a discussion group of playtesters that are very sophisticated, because they can kind of feel pushed out, um, uh, because just you know, it's 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 hard to to argue with the with, with some of the you know that there can be a bit of an elitism that that, that comes along with a with an incredible knowledge of a game, uh, and uh, that certainly is one archetype that that should be very well be paid attention to from our side, but not the only one. But uh, but I will add the, you know that we have I do feel like we have gone out of our way to um, to recruit a a diverse pool of testers for KeyForge. 
uh, people that are, it includes some top tier tournament players for sure, but I have about 40 active play testers right now that are uh, engaged uh, with Keyforce development. And they include some top tier tournament players, um, but they also include a significant number of people that are self-described casual players. Uh, and people who, uh, who's, who love Keyforge Adventures, and if, and for a couple of people, it's like that's their primary way to play Keyforge is Keyforge Adventures, um, and uh, and I think that's important. Um, it's important that the testing pool uh, kind of reflects the diversity of the player base and and the customer base. It all you know, it's it's also an international group. Um, I have there are players in Europe and, as well as Southeast Asia uh, that are actively engaged. Um, there's some retailers that are in the group because that's all. That's another perspective that uh, that I think is important uh, to to the game. So, uh, and, and I think yeah. I think the, the the good news about having that group we have now is it is that we were able to have that hard break and kind of relaunch. Uh, and so, mm. the trick then becomes in five or six sets from now, uh, have the development team been able to keep that group as versus mm. and, and with many as many insights as that and and that that's where i think over time just from a human management perspective it just you, you kind of yeah. get comfortable you get a comfort zone and, and uh, you kind of narrow it down so so it's 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 incumbent on us to have the wisdom to to know that that's going to be a, a kind of a tax we have to bear going forward yeah yeah Vol- volunteer management uh, both in the how's it serving the vision and then how are we man- helping manage these volunteers is it's always a challenge, and I can see that for the the play testers. Um, but the the play testers, I know, were uh, I I think involved in uh, the the final touches on on Winds of Exchange between acquisition and then printing. Uh, how uh, what did the development process look like, and how many changes generally occurred between getting Winds of Exchange and then uh, hitting print for Keyforge Celebration? Winds of Exchange was very far along when we. When we acquire KeyForge, I would say that um, what people are going to see as Winds of Exchange is about ninety percent the mm. way it was when we took over from FFG. So we we did that final ten percent um, uh, was that kind of final level of polish was definitely important work uh, that we did uh, in the months leading up to to KFC. Um, but it is the credit for Winds of Exchange, mm. uh, by and large, um, is in the hands of FFG. Agree. Uh, Grim Reminders is a is a is the next set, of course, and, and we are already um, working on Grim Reminders. Um, that is that is uh, not as far along as Winds of Exchange was. Um, FFG did get a good start on Grim Reminders, but it is in a much more unfinished state at mm. this time. So yeah. we will... It's, it's feeling a little haunted, maybe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was actually writing, trying to write some of the background, uh, uh, some of the background lore for for the um, the new faction today, and uh, which is ah. a story, story that weaves in and out of, of uh, both this new adventure that we're making follow the house Gorman Geist and, and the new set Grim Reminders, which are connected. That's, that's very exciting. That's very exciting. And how, how was a fall of house Gorman Geist looking? I know the other two adventures took inspirations uh, when they were developed at FFG from other highly successful cooperative game models. Is there, is there any inspirations on that level for house fall of house Gorman Geist or is it, or is it off often to its own ghost galaxy, uh, realm of design um it's it's not as far along as as i would have liked for sure uh, i i've sort of been been on my plate to sort of develop we have all all the core mechanics in and kind of, and kind mm-hmm. of the storyline but but we haven't uh, we haven't fleshed it out it, so so it's it is definitely on our on our development plate that will probably be the last thing that will get refined and, and finished here in the next four six weeks uh, but before we start uh, hopefully can start you know getting some of our production to uh to, to be finalized and get them out to backers and you you say you're focusing on the law of the new house, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and uh, I don't know how you 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 uh, held yourself back from calling them Ghost Galaxy as a as a faction, <laughs> but um, it, 
<laughs> is there anything you're really excited about with that new faction that you're 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 keen to share today, or is it all under wraps? I, let's let's keep it under wraps because because it it, it definitely uh, it, it definitely is something that that I think can use some pushback from the rest of the team, and and uh, it, I I think it's a I just hope that it's kind of a delightful whimsically dark um addition yeah. <laughs> to, to you know to the to the to the crucible um I, I usually get myself in trouble when i write background stuff because because i usually write too much so but it's it's always better to do that than, than to write too little um but that's where it's at right now i was just asked actually just just two days ago saying can i can we please ha- have this lore for this new faction because we, we we have some work that we'll, we need to get a summary of the faction together for and and so uh, i've been i've been behind but uh no i, I think uh hopefully you guys will all love it i, I think the first uh, the, the first hints uh of, of what that lore will be will come in in the gormengeist um the gormengeist adventure which which we're kind of putting together as a bit of a origin story uh to to introduce mm. uh the, this new faction yeah fantastic i'm very, very excited for that. Uh, whimsically dark, it sounds like uh, if Rogers and Hammerstein had tried to do a take of uh, Hall of a House of Usher, we might end up, I think, with some of the things we're seeing here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or yes, yes, <laughs> yep. Maybe Tim Burton uh, or, or mm. something to that effect. Oh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Incredibly excited about that. Um, if I may sneak in one last question very briefly. Um, of, of course, one of the most beautiful things about Keyforge is that it's very much a shared experience that transcends borders. It is played all over the world and um, discovered by by many and, and, and played an experience in different ways. And I think that sort of wraps up different elements of the conversation that we've had. However, I, I can imagine for, for you both looking at logistics at the moment, it is probably an utter nightmare to try and ensure that the game gets to where, where you want it to be and when you want it to be. So um, for our listeners in all the diverse corners of the planet, um, you know, what, what is your, your vision to uh, doing the best <laughs> that you can do, of course, to in, ensuring that it gets into the hands of people that I, I mean, in the same uh, calendar year, perhaps <laughs> as a, as a, as another as another part. Uh, of as the, long as uh, you mean next calendar year, I feel pretty good. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah, now the, we 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 will we will have some logistics. I mean, particularly when it comes to localization and translation, uh, which is something that we that we promised. Uh, we are uh, that is the one part of the software that is not quite ready yet. To, is to the ability to add the localized languages to our deck generation. So that that's currently being built. And once that's ready, then we will start the, start the project of going out and getting, uh, getting the localized translations. Um, Alex, Alex Bartos is, is on our sales side. He's working with um, the, some of the commercial contacts that we have in other languages to, to, to try to see if we can reignite getting Keyforge out in other languages. Um, I've always been a little bit careful with that because I, um, it's a very complex thing to do to put a, a product out in many different languages and try to get them out at the same time uh, and so on. And it's and I, I've actually seen games get where the the desire for the logistics and the simultaneous global production was higher than actually the the survival the desire for the game to survive because either the game would be so delayed or compromised in, in, in ways in order to facilitate that global distribution that that uh, it, it injured uh, it has injured games in the past uh, underneath my watch where where there were simply enormous the, the problem when you have when you make games is that typically you you were, your production is held up by the whatever slowest element uh, is um, and and uh, that often can be related to internationalization of, of, of various kinds. So, so the one thing I promised uh, going into this is that ultimately we are a, we're a U.S. company. We produce the game in English uh, and we are going to do the best we can to service other languages. But, but we can't uh, let, let the enormous complexity of trying to, to deal with, with a, a large international program threaten the, that actually core what the game is. So that, that's, that's a, uh, um, I don't mean to scare any international uh, fans, you know, out of that. But we are going to. But, but with that, we're, we're trying to do some different ways that we're going to manufacture the game, 
and make it available uh, elsewhere. Uh, and we're, we're hopefully making some advancements in how we can uh, include the localization, the language localizations, uh, and, and make it, bring it a step closer than, than it's been done before to avoid delays. Um, but certainly it is, it is a global game that, that, that is enjoyed by, by many across the world. And we, we will try our best to, uh, to, to live up to that. But it's, it, there's a, that is also a little bit of a falling knife. Um, Sounds like a very sensible approach, though. And um, thank you again for your transparency on this and really absolutely everything that you've done since taking taking the uh, um, custodianship of, of this wonderful game that we, we all love. You're welcome. Trying what we're doing, doing our best. Thank you for having us, guys. We appreciate the uh, everything that you do for the community. Oh, of course. Well, we just uh, can't stop talking about it, so we figured it might be a little more efficient or a little uh, less strange if there were microphones in front of us while we did that. So that was the, that was the solution, but yeah, thank you both so much uh, for sharing, uh, being generous with your time, sharing that with us, bringing some wonderful answers. Uh, we look forward to uh, more news, retail releases, uh, the 2023 tournament season, all this sort of thing, uh, all the hundreds of things coming up. We're very excited to see, to see all of that from you all. And uh, we'll be, we'll be as much of that stuff as we can looking forward. We to look it. forward to it. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Dear listener, thank you so much for joining us for that amazing conversation we had the honor of having with Christian T. Peterson and Michael Hurley of Ghost Galaxy. Like you heard, there's still a lot of work for them to do, a lot of things to prove, but I'm hopeful for the future and things are looking good. I personally cannot wait for the 2023 tournament season. Just a reminder that most of the questions you heard today, we actually got from our Patreon-only Discord. If you want to hear about our guests coming up, be able to submit questions yourself, then go jump over there, sign up for uh, some supporting us monthly. We will appreciate it from the depths of our hearts. Uh, you have tiers starting at $3.00 over there on the Patreon. Of course, make sure you're subscribed. Uh, we have episodes coming out each Thursday uh, for the rest of uh, the few weeks left in the year here. We are so excited about that. It's a couple of first look deck discovery episodes where uh, I got a camera, I got Ed, I opened a deck live so Ed could see it. Ed knows nothing about Winds of Exchange, and of course I have a bit more experience with it, so it's an awful lot of fun going through two brand new, never seen before decks with Ed live on the mic for our next two episodes. We have some exciting stuff coming for 2023. As always, you can interact with us and reach out to us on Twitter at Call of Discovery or email us at podcast at callofdiscovery.com. Uh, and we can't be more excited for the future of Keyforge right now, so expect to hear a lot more Call of Discovery in 2023. Have you answered the Call of Discovery? 